I, first, we have here a gospel rejected. One would have imagined that, when God sent his gospel to men, all men would meekly listen, and humbly receive its truths. We should have thought that God's ministers had but to proclaim that life is brought to light by the gospel, and that Christ is come to save sinners, and every ear would be attentive, every eye would be fixed, and every heart would be wide open to receive the truth. We should have said, judging favorably of our fellow creatures, that there would not exist in the world a monster so vile, so depraved, so polluted, as to put so much as a stone in the way of the progress of truth, we could not have conceived such a thing, yet that conception is the truth. When the gospel was preached, instead of being accepted and admired, one universal hiss went up to heaven, men could not bear it. Its first preacher they dragged to the brow of the hill, and would have sent him down headlong, yeah, they did more, they nailed him to the cross, and there they let him languish out his dying life in agony such as no man hath borne since. All his chosen ministers have been hated and abhorred by worldlings, instead of being listened to they have been scoffed at treated as if they were the offscouring of all things, and the very scum of mankind. Look at the holy men in the old times, how they were driven from city to city, persecuted, afflicted, tormented, stoned to death, wherever the enemy had power to do so. Those friends of men, those real philanthropists, who came with hearts big with love, and hands full of mercy, and lips pregnant with celestial fire, and souls that burned with holy influence. Those men were treated as if they were spies in the camp, as if they were deserters from the common cause of mankind, as if they were enemies, and not, as they truly were, the best of friends. Do not suppose, my friends, that men like the gospel any better now than they did then. There is an idea that you are growing better. I do not believe it. You are growing worse. In Many respects men may be better, outwardly better, the heart within is still the same. The human heart of today dissected would be like the human heart a thousand years ago, the gall of bitterness within that breast of yours, is just as bitter as the gall of bitterness in that of Simon of old. We have in our hearts the same latent opposition to the truth of God, and hence we find men, even as of old, who scorn the gospel. I shall, in speaking of the gospel rejected, endeavor to point out the two classes of persons who equally despise truth. The Jews make it a stumbling block, and the Greeks account it foolishness. Now these two very respectable gentlemen, the Jew and the Greek, I am not going to make these ancient individuals the object of my condemnation, but I look upon them as members of a great parliament, representatives of a great constituency, and I shall attempt to show that, if all the race of Jews were cut off, there would be still a great number in the world who would answer to the name of Jews, to whom Christ is a stumbling block, and that if Greece were swallowed up by some earthquake, and cease to be a nation, there would still be the Greek unto whom the gospel would be foolishness. I shall simply introduce the Jew and the Greek, and let them speak a moment to you, in order that you may see the gentlemen who represent you, the representative men, the persons who stand for many of you, who as yet are not called by divine grace. The first is a Jew, to him the gospel is a stumbling block. A respectable man the Jew was in his day, all formal religion was concentrated in his person. He went up to the temple very devoutly, he tithed all he had, even to the mint and the cumin. You would see him fast twice in the week, with a face all marked with sadness and sorrow. If you looked at him, he had the law between his eyes, there was the phylactery, and the borders of his garments of amazing width, that he might never be supposed to be a Gentile dog, that no one might ever conceive that he was not an Hebrew of pure descent. He had a holy ancestry, he came of a pious family, a right good man was he. He could not like those Sadducees at all, who had no religion. He was thoroughly a religious man, he stood up for his synagogue, he would not have that temple on Mount Gerizim, he could not bear the Samaritans, he had no dealings. With them, he was a religionist of the first order, a man of the very finest kind, a specimen of a man who is a moralist, and who loves the Ceremonies of the law. Accordingly, when he heard about Christ, he asked who Christ was. The son of a carpenter. Ah. The son of a carpenter, and his mother's name was Mary, and his father's name was Joseph. That of itself is presumption enough, said he, positive proof, in fact, that he cannot be the Messiah. And what does he say? Why, he says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. That won't do. Moreover, he says, it is not by the works of the flesh that any man can enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
the Jew tied a double knot in his phylactery at once, he thought he would have the borders of his garment made twice as broad. He bowed to the Nazarene. No, no, and if so much as a disciple crossed the street, he thought the place polluted, and would not tread in his steps. Do you think he would give up his old father's religion, the religion which came from Mount Sinai, that old? Religion that lay in the ark and the overshadowing cherubim. He give. That up. Not he. A vile imposter, that is all Christ was in his eyes. He thought so. A stumbling block to me, I cannot hear about it, I will not listen to it. Accordingly, he turned a deaf ear to all the preacher's eloquence, and listened not at all. Farewell, old Jew. Thou sleepest with thy fathers, and thy generation is a wandering race, still walking the earth. Farewell. I have done with thee. Alas. Poor wretch, that Christ, who was thy stumbling block, shall be thy judge, and on thy head shall be that loud curse. His blood be on us and on our children. But I am going to find out Mr. Jew here in Exeter Hall, persons who answer to his description, to whom Jesus Christ is a stumbling block. Let me introduce you to yourselves, some of you. You were of a pious family too, were you not? Yes. And you have a religion which you love, you love it so far as the chrysalis of it goes, the outside, the covering, the husk. You would not have one rubric altered, nor one of those dear old arches. Taken down, nor the stained glass removed, for all the world, and any man who should say a word against such things, you would set down as a heretic at once. Or, perhaps, you do not go to such a place of worship, but you love some plain old meeting house, where your forefathers worshipped, called a dissenting chapel. Ah! It is a beautiful plain place, you love it, you love its ordinances, you love its exterior and if any one spoke against the place, how vexed you would feel. You think that what they do there, they ought to do everywhere, in fact, your church is a model one. The place where you go is exactly the sort of place for everybody, and if I were to ask you why you hope to go to heaven, you would perhaps say, because I am a Baptist, or, because I am an Episcopalian, or whatever other sect you belong to. There is yourself, I know Jesus Christ will be to you a stumbling block. If I come and tell you, that all your going to the house of God is good for nothing, if I tell you that all those many times you have been singing and praying, all pass for nothing in the sight of God, because you are a hypocrite and a formalist. If I tell you that your heart is not right with God, and that unless it is so, all the external is good for nothing, I know what you will say, I shan't hear that young man again. It is a stumbling block. If you had stepped in anywhere where you had heard formalism exalted, if you had been told, this must you do, and this other must you do, and then you will be saved, you would highly approve of it. But how many are there externally religious, with whose characters you could find no fault, but who have never had the regenerating influence of the holy ghost, who never were made to lie prostrate on their face before Calvary's cross, who never turned a wistful eye to yonder Saviour crucified, who never put their trust in him that was slain for the sons of men. They love a superficial religion, but when a man talks deeper than that, they set it down for cant. You may love all that is external about religion, just as you may love a man for his clothes, caring nothing for the man himself. If so, I know you are one of those who reject the gospel. You will hear me preach, and while I speak about the externals, you will hear me with attention, whilst I plead for morality and argue against drunkenness, or show the heinousness of Sabbath breaking, but if once I say, except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye can in no wise enter into the kingdom of God, if once I tell you that you must be elected of God, that you must be purchased with the Saviour's blood, that you must be converted by the Holy Ghost, you say, he is a fanatic. Away with him, away with him. We do not want to hear that any more. Christ crucified, is to the Jew, the ceremonialist, a stumbling block. But there is another specimen of this Jew to be found. He is thoroughly orthodox in his sentiments. As for forms and ceremonies, he thinks nothing about them. He goes to a place of worship where he learns sound doctrine. He will hear nothing but what is true. He likes that we should have good works and morality. He is a good man, and no one can find fault with him. Here he is, regular in his Sunday pew. In the market he walks before men in all honesty, so you would imagine. 
ask him about any doctrine, and he can give you a disquisition upon it. In fact, he could write a treatise upon anything in the Bible, and a great many things besides. He knows almost everything, and here, up in this dark attic of the head, his religion has taken up its abode, he has a best parlour down in his heart, but his religion never goes there, that is shut against it. He has money in there, mammon, worldliness, or he has something else, self-love, pride. Perhaps he loves to hear experimental preaching, he admires it all, in fact, he loves anything that is sound. But then, he has not any sound in himself, or rather, it is all sound and there is no substance. He likes to hear true doctrine, but it never penetrates his inner man. You never see him weep. Preach to him about Christ crucified, a glorious subject, and you never see a tear roll down. His cheek, tell him of the mighty influence of the Holy Ghost, he admires you for it, but he never had the hand of the Holy Spirit on his soul, tell him about communion with God, plunging in Godhead's deepest sea, and being lost in its immensity, the man loves to hear, but he never experiences, he has never communed with Christ, and accordingly, when you once begin to strike home, when you lay him on the table, take out your dissecting knife, begin to cut him up, and show him his own heart, let him see what it is by nature, and what it must. Become by grace, the man starts, he cannot stand that, he wants none of that, Christ received in the heart, and accepted. Albeit that he loves it enough in the head, tees to him a stumbling block, and he casts it away. Do you see yourselves here, my friends? See yourselves as God sees you? For so it is, here be many to whom Christ is as much a stumbling block now as ever he was. O ye formalists! I speak to you, O ye who have the nutshell, but abhor the kernel, O ye who like the trappings and the dress, but care not for that fair virgin who is clothed therewith, O ye who like the paint and the tinsel, but abhor the solid gold, I speak to you, I ask you, does your religion give you solid comfort? Can you stare death in the face with it, and say, I know that my Redeemer liveth? Can you close your eyes at night, singing as your Vesper song? I to the end must endure. As sure as the earnest is given? Can you bless God for affliction? Can you plunge in, accounted as ye are, and swim through all the floods of trial? Can you march triumphant through the lion's den, laugh at affliction, and bid defiance to hell? Can you? No. Your gospel is an effeminate thing, a thing of words and sounds, and not of power. Cast it from you, I beseech you, it is not worth your keeping, and when you come before the throne of God, you will find it will fail you and fail you so that you shall never find another, for lost, ruined, destroyed, ye shall find that Christ, who is now, a stumbling block, will be your judge. I have found out the Jew, and I have now to discover the Greek. He is a person of quite a different exterior to the Jew. As to the phylactery, to him it is all rubbish, and as to the broad-hemmed garment, he despises it. He does not care for the forms of religion, he has an intense aversion, in fact, to broad-brimmed hats or to everything which looks like outward show. He likes eloquence, he admires a smart saying, he loves a quaint expression, he likes to read the last new book, he is a Greek, and to him the gospel is foolishness. The Greek is a gentleman found everywhere, nowadays, manufactured sometimes in colleges, constantly made in schools, produced everywhere. He is on the exchange, in the market, he keeps a shop, rides in a carriage, he is noble, a gentleman, he is everywhere, even in court he is thoroughly wise. Ask him anything, and he knows it. Ask for a quotation from any of the old poets, or anyone else, and he can give it you. If you are a Mohammedan, and plead the claims of your religion, he will hear you very patiently. But if you are a Christian, and talk to him of Jesus Christ, stop your cant, he says, I don't want to hear anything about that. This Grecian gentleman believes all philosophy except the true one, he studies all wisdom except the wisdom of God, he likes all learning except spiritual learning, he loves everything except that which God approves, he likes everything which man makes, and nothing which comes from God, it is foolishness to him, confounded foolishness. You have only to discourse about one doctrine in the Bible, and he shuts his ears, he wishes no longer for your company, it is foolishness. I have met this gentleman a great many times. Once, when I saw him, he told me he did not believe in any religion at all, and when I said I did, and had a hope that when I died I should go to heaven, he said he dared say it was very comfortable, but he did not believe in 
religion, and that he was sure it was best to live as nature dictated. Another time he spoke well of all religions, and believed they were very good in their place, and all true, and he had no doubt that, if a man were sincere in any kind of religion, he would be all right at last. I told him I did not think so, and that I believed there was but one religion revealed of God, the religion of God's elect, the religion which is the gift of Jesus. He then said I was a begot, and wished me good morning. It was to him foolishness. He had nothing to do with me at all. He either liked no religion, or every religion. Another time I held him by the coat button, and I discussed with him a little about faith. He said, it is all very well, I believe that is true Protestant doctrine. But presently I said something about election, and he said, I don't like that, many people have preached that and turned it to bad account. I then hinted. Something about free grace, but that he could not endure, it was to him. Foolishness. He was a polished Greek, and thought that if he were not chosen, he ought to be. He never liked that passage, God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and the things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. He thought it was very discreditable to the Bible and when the book was revised, he had no doubt it would be cut out. To such a man, for he is here this morning, very likely come to hear this reed shaken of the wind, I have to say this, ah. Thou wise man, full of worldly wisdom, thy wisdom will stand thee here, but what wilt thou do in the swellings of Jordan? Philosophy may do well for thee to learn upon whilst thou walkest through this world, but the river is deep, and thou wilt want something more than that. If thou hast not the arm of the Most High to hold thee up in the flood and cheer thee with promises, thou wilt sink, man, with all thy philosophy, thou wilt sink, with all thy learning, thou shalt sink and be washed into that awful ocean of eternal torment, where thou shalt be forever. Ah! Greeks, it may be foolishness to you, but ye shall see the man your judge, and then shall ye rue the day that e'er ye said that God's gospel was foolishness.